Hey, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Awesome. Um, now for something completely different. Um, one thing I want to do, I don't know how many, what the like general like skill level is in here. So if I'm going too fast at any point, will you just like put up your hand? And the, so I can be like, okay, let me slow it down. Because my tendency is to go too fast when you speak in general, I hear. Um, but hi, my name is Jared. Um, I am fairly new to Portland. I've been here a year, and so been coming here for about that long. So I'm super glad to be with you. Um, I work for a company called JetBuilt, where we do not make jets, and we do make software for people who install audiovisual systems. And I'm here to talk to you today about some features I learned around caching features in Rails 5 that were kind of surprising to me, not maybe that well documented, um, but actually have had a large impact on our cache efficiency, hence profit. Uh, so the TLDR of this talk is uh, go turn it on, and then some stuff happens, and then profit. Uh, and that's true, uh, sort of. Um, the caveat, you need to be running Rails 5.2 or higher, but the setting is going to be the default in Rails 6. Um, you must be using a Rails maintained cache store, hence not Dolly store, but memcache store or Redis store are cool. And then if you're making any calls to the low level caching features yourself, if you're calling rails.cache.fetch, you're going to have to do a couple manual updates. But that looks like this. Before, you might pass the cache key directly in an array. Um, and now you want to pass the actual object because, uh, well, actually, for reasons that I will get into shortly. Um, so the only difference between these two lines is you're passing in, if, you're, if this is happening within a model, you're passing in the model itself and not the cache key method of the model. So prior to this change, or this feature, I should say, um, say you had a project model. That's an active record model. Um, and you have a total and method. And that total does something expensive. And you say, aha, I'm going to cache that. Um, so you might write something like this. This is the kind of that low level caching I was talking about. Um, where you're going to pass in the cache key and the total. And it's going to generate, the cache key method is going to generate something that looks like this. You're going to have the name of the model pluralized. You're going to have the ID of the model. And you're going to have this long string, which is the timestamp. And you're going to use that as your cache key. Um, so concatenated in that array, this might be too low, sorry, but it's got total on the end of it. And this is what's gonna go out to your cache. You say, hey, is this key in there? So I wanna run through a little like simulation of what this actually looks like to illustrate the drawbacks of this. Uh, so let's say you've got the company credit card and you go buy a big cache with three slots in it. Um, and you start filling that with data. So first, let's say we have a project, and it has a total of one. And you ask the cache, hey, is this key in there? And it is not in there. And so you store one in that cache slot. And you do the same thing with project two, which has a convenient and contrived total of two. And then you do the same thing. Oh, I'm sorry. And then project two gets updated, and the total is now three. And you're just going to store that in your third slot, because that cache key does not exist in your cache store. And then what happens here is now we're updating project number two again, where the total is number four, but we're out of cache space. So now we've got to evict something out of our cache. The typical strategy that most cache stores use is the least recently used item you're going to take out of the cache. So what happens here is that one is the oldest value, and we're going to slide this new cache value for project number two in there. And the issue is immediately apparent. So now our cache is completely full, and two thirds of the values in our cache are no longer useful to us. They're now outdated. And also, we've evicted uh, a value that could still be valid from the product number one. So I don't know what happened. Please stand by. Aha. Okay. Our cache is full. We're not happy with it. Um, so this is exactly the problem that um, recyclable cache keys were designed to solve. 
Um, when you turn on this versioning setting, uh, cache key now returns something different. It returns only the name of the model and the ID of the model. The timestamp isn't on there anymore. The timestamp is now in the separate method called cache version. And, but I should mention that only that cache key is passed to the cache store directly now, which is something I didn't know. Um, so when you do something like this, you call rash Rails cache read and you pass it a model or an array containing your model and uh, a string. Um, all it's gonna pass is project slash one. This has some interesting implications. So we run the exact same scenario through uh, with cache keys turned on. Um, I've made one change of noting you're gonna pass self and not cache key up the top there. But here's what happens. We fill Project one with one, great. Project two with two, great. Now, when project two updates, instead of filling it into that empty cache slot, it matches the cache key for the previous value. So now, we overwrite that cache, and this is kind of the notion, this is where the name recyclable cache keys comes from. Um, and the same thing, so if it gets updated again, the cache key matches, and so it fills the same slot. And this is a big win. Now we've got data that was evicted in a previous scenario, available for caching, and we've got this empty slot down here, and the business is happy and profit. But you might have asked, like, what happens with a version? Um, key thing missing here is without the version as part of the actual cache key, you might be wondering, how do you know if a value you read from the cache is stale and no longer what you wanted? And this is kind of not well explained, like, in the Rails guides at all. So this is why I kind of dug into it and wanted to bring this here and share it with you guys. So we've got that cache version string that's in there. Um, when you call Rails cache store and pass it a model, um, what happens is it does not store the actual value you pass, in this case one, in the cache store. Instead, it stores a serialized uh, object that's called active support entry. And that contains the value that you pass to it, but also contains the version. Um, when you pass uh, an array to Rails cache store, Store. Um, it calls this method we're gonna look at in just a minute called um, normalize version. And what that does is it's gonna sort through the array and look for objects that respond to versions so it can pull it out and construct this active support entry object from it. So here's like what that looks like. It's actually not that complicated. I just like bundle open active support and start reading it and you're like, oh, this is not actually that bad. Um, when you initialize uh, an entry object, um, this is, class is contained in the same file as the other cache functions in Rails. Um, it stores the value, it stores the version, and then it defines this method called mismatch, which it uses to compare against the, the version that you pass in with the version of the object you read from the cache. And so check it out. When you, when you call cache.read, I'll just, I'll just run through this line by line. Normalize key is basically gonna take um, whatever you pass in, whether that's an array or single object, and generate the cache key from that. Um, when you have uh, this option turned on, again, that's just like projects slash one. Otherwise, if it's off, it's the whole string with the timestamp. Um, then it calls normalized version, and this does something very similar, where it's gonna look at the type of object you pass in and try to extract a version from it. You can pass in multiple models, and it'll extract multiple versions, as long as it responds to updated at, and then concatenate those together, which is interesting too. Um, then we do the actual going and reading from the cache. So it's gonna call read entry with the key, which is the cache key. So in, in our new example, project slash one, um, and then store that as entry. If there's a cache hit, then we start doing some interesting things. Um, we check to see if it's expired, which is an option you can pass the cache that's kind of beyond scope here. And then here's our call, the next line, else if entry dot mismatched. This is, this is exactly what you saw before from the active support entry object. So this is gonna check the version of the object you passed in to read with the version of the object that it pulled from the cache. See if they match. If they don't match, it returns nil. So it effectively looks to your application like a cache miss if the versions don't match. Um, even though you may have actually had a cache hit. Um, because the cache miss also returns nil down below. Otherwise, we're gonna return the value that we pulled from the cache because it's cache hit. And that's really it. Um, that's the extent of like the logic for this feature. And 
you can imagine if you have larger than a cache of three, you're gonna be able to have far more cache hits and, the, and more empty slots to store more things in your cache. Um, it's just better cache efficiency all the way around. So you're gonna be able to get more value for your dollar out of a smaller cache or more performance and more cache efficiency out of a bigger cache. Ah, profit. And that's all, thank you. Any questions? Cool. Thanks. Oh, sure. The problem with solving was that previously the timestamp was a part of the cache key that was being passed. So every time the timestamp changed, the cache you'd fill up a, a different entry in your a different slot in your cache. With this option turned on, the timestamp is no longer part of the cache key, and instead you're comparing. Um, what the object you pull out of the cache with the version um, passed in from uh, whatever you pass into uh, your Rails cache fetch or read. Um, does that answer it? So because, because, so basically you have more cache hits because your cache key isn't dependent on the timestamp of the record you pass in. Um, then you're not filling up your cache with outdated data because the cache key is always, for the same model, is always gonna be the same. So you're always storing the same, the cache for a same model in the same spot in your cache. So it just reduces a lot of your cache garbage. Yep. Hmm. It's a good question. I hadn't thought about it. I certainly, well, maybe Brent can. There you go. There you go. I think generally for the types of things that Rails is encouraging you to cache, such as HTML snippets, no. Which is why they're turning us on in the default as Rail, in Rails 6. Yep. <laughs> yep, that might be fair. Right. However, I think if you're storing small things in your cache, this is probably going to be a win. It certainly was for us. I think their anecdote was they increased like their length of time objects would stay in the cache from like a month to like several months. And Personally, like we cache a lot of similar like HTML snippets, and our cache hit rate doubled when I increased this, like without doing anything else. It was like it's low. I need to do something. Let's turn this on. In addition to increasing the size of the cache in general, um, this is something you, do, you can do to get more efficiency out of your cache. Yep. Yes. Yes. The reason why you want to change that is because um, you want an ob in order to take advantage of the versioning, you need to pass into the Rails cache method an object that responds to, that it, that it can extract a version from. So if you're manually passing a cache key as a string, it's going to do exactly the same as what it did before. Um, correct. Correct. Yeah. Does that make sense? Did I explain that? Right. Yes. Well, yes and no. So, so previous to this, it was a combination of the ID and the timestamp, right? And now it's just the ID. So yes, it will still be at unique per, uh, your, per record in the database, um, but it won't be specific to when that model was updated any longer when you turn this on, which is the feature. Cool, thanks guys. <laughs>